Solution formation and solubility are going to be the topic in this lesson. We're going to take a look at the three-step process for forming a solution, and we'll see how it affects whether or not a particular solute is going to be soluble in a particular solvent. We'll talk about some uh, different solution vocabulary along the way, and then we'll take a look at a few factors affecting solubility. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do DAT, OAT, and MCAT prep as well. Now, this lesson's part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several lessons a week throughout the school year, so if you want to be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel click the bell notification. So we'll start by taking a look at the three-step process for solution formation. And it turns out these three steps, simply put, you've got to break apart and separate out the solvent molecules so that you've got space in, bet in between here to fit some solute particles. So if the solute's going to be all spread out throughout the solvent, then you've got to break apart any intermolecular forces in the solutes as well. And so they've got to be broken apart, and then they're going to mix together. And we're going to take a look at the energetics involved in this process. Now, if you've got to break intermolecular forces in separating out the solvent molecules and in separating out the solute molecules, so then that's going to be endothermic in both, both cases. And if you recall, endothermic refers to delta H being positive. And so for these first two steps, separating out the solvent and solute particles respectively, delta H is going to be positive. But now that you've got them separated, now you can take one of these solute particles and fit it in between a bunch of solute particles, as we've got written over here. And in this case, we're now going to have a chance to form some intermolecular forces. And if breaking apart intermolecular forces is endothermic, then forming new intermolecular forces is going to be exothermic. So, and then the overall delta H for the solution process would just simply be the sum of the delta H's for all three of these steps. Now, it turns out you're really your best case scenario is that the intermolecular forces you form over here are roughly equivalent in strength to the combination of the ones you broke over here. And so it turns out your best case scenario is that delta H for the overall process comes out to right around zero. So it turns out uh, that it's favorable of delta H to be negative and unfavorable for delta H to be positive in terms of what we call spontaneity, for a process to be spontaneous. And so in this case, it turns out we're never probably going to get delta H to be a whole lot of negative. Best case scenario, again, delta H is zero. So what you really want to avoid, though, is that you don't want delta H for the overall process to be positive, and we'll return to that in just a second. So it turns out there's two things affect affecting whether or not this is going to be spontaneous, and one of them is this delta H. So, and we see here that, you know, best case scenario, delta H is zero. It's not helping us in spontaneity, but it's not hurting us either. So, but it turns out the other one that's going to be a driving force is what we call the entropy of mixing. So and we'll spend a little more time talking about entropy towards the end of second semester general chemistry in a chapter on thermodynamics. So, but suffice it to say now, entropy is related to randomness. And an increase in randomness is also favorable. So it turns out the two things affecting spontaneity are going to be delta H. So, and again, delta H being negative is going to help us get there. Or it turns out having an increase in this entropy, an increase in randomness. And so the way this works, you get this increase in entropy when you get a mixture. And so initially we start out with pure solvent, pure solute, and there's not as much randomness there as when they're actually mixed together and you've got some of both in the same solution now. And so that's usually the driving force between a solute and a solvent mixing is this entropy of mixing. And the big thing here for this to be the driving factor is you really need delta H to not be hindering the spontaneity of the process. And so you really want delta H to come out as close to zero as possible. So, and it turns out for that to happen, it turns out that the strength of the intermolecular forces you're forming between solute and solvent have to be comparable in strength to the overall ones you're breaking within the solvent and within the solute combined. And it turns out we've got uh, an easy way to remember when that happens. That happens when like dissolves like. And what we mean in terms that the solute and the solvent are going to be alike in terms of polarity. And so we want them to have the same kind of intermolecular forces. We want them both to have a fair amount of hydrogen bonding, let's say, or to both have a fair, you know, fairly strong dipole-dipole forces, or to both just have only London dispersion forces. And so we want them to be alike in polarity. We either want them to both be very, very polar, or very, very nonpolar, or maybe both intermediate polarity, or something along these lines. If they're very much alike, then the intermolecular forces you form between solute and solvent will be similar in strength to the ones that broke apart here, in which case the overall delta H of the solution process is zero, but the entropy of mixing will make the process spontaneous. So that's kind of the deal here uh, for the entropy of mixing. So 
you might be given a, a question. It might say, you know, which of the following would be soluble or most soluble in water is a question. Well, you've got to know that water is really polar and is capable of hydrogen bonding. And so if you want something to be very soluble in it, you want to pick something that's got lots of hydrogen bonding and is very polar. And so maybe we pick, so uh, let's pick CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3. And it turns out that's butane. It's just a hydrocarbon, has no electronegative atoms whatsoever, and it's a nonpolar molecule. And it turns out these are not gonna mix well at all as a result, because you're trying to mix something polar with something nonpolar, not gonna happen. So, but however, if I take ethanol here, so an ethanol now having that OH bond is fairly polar and is capable of hydrogen bonding. Now it's not quite as polar as water, but it's still pretty polar in its own right. And now if I had to pick one of these two to be which one's more soluble in water, I would definitely be picking the ethanol. Now, if on the other hand, I had to pick which one was more soluble in cyclohexane. So, well, cyclohexane is formula C6H12 and being a hydrocarbon, only hydrogens and carbons, no electronegative atoms, it's nonpolar. And so if I wanna know which one of these is gonna be more soluble in cyclohexane, well, I'd definitely be picking the other nonpolar one. And this is typically how a question like this might be phrased. They're either gonna give you something really polar as a solvent, and then you wanna pick the solute that's most polar to be soluble in it, or they're gonna give you something really nonpolar as a solvent, and then you wanna pick the one that's lowest in polarity to be soluble in it. Okay, we've got a little more vocabulary to go through here. And so next words we're gonna deal with are miscible and immiscible. So and these are words re reserved for the solubility of a liquid solute in a liquid solvent. And so it turns out if you're mixing two liquids, if they can mix in any proportion, we refer to them as being miscible. And it turns out ethanol and water exactly fit that description. You can mix ethanol in water in any proportion. They will fully dissolve in any proportion or ratio you mix them in. At the other end of the spectrum, we have immiscible, and that's when two liquids largely don't mix to any significant extent whatsoever. And you might see that with like oil and water, and te technically you'd see it with butane and water. So, but oil and water might be something you're more familiar with, but you mix oil and water and the oil's gonna settle out in a layer on top of the water, and there's gonna be no appreciable mixing between them at all. And so we'd say that oil and water are immiscible instead. Cool, a little review of some other vocab words we might have touched on a little bit in first semester and that's saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated. So it turns out for any given solute and solvent combination, you're gonna reach a limit to the maximum amount of solute that might be dissolved in that solvent. So, and when you've reached that maximum, we say the solution is saturated. Now, if you're less than that maxim, maximum, then it's just gonna be unsaturated. Now, it turns out on very, uh, rare and special conditions, you might actually go past the normal saturation point. And we refer to it as being a super saturated solution. And again, this most notably happens in something like when you're making rock candy, if you ever made rock candy and uh, as a kid in elementary school or something like that. But what they do is they heat up water. So, cause we'll find out that a lot of solids, including sugar are more soluble when the temperature is higher. And so you heat up that water and you can dissolve a whole lot more sugar in there and you make a saturated solution but then you very, very slowly and gently cool down that water. And because it was saturated at the higher temperature, well, as you cool it, the solubility goes down, but as long as you do it, do it very gently, very slowly, so all that sugar actually has a chance of staying all dissolved. And it's not a stable situation. And it turns out if you add a little crystal in there at that point when it's at that lower temperature now, um, or anything of the sort, you know, you put a string in there, put a stick in there, anything with a jagged surface that crystals can grow on, uh, you're gonna see a bunch of crystal formation very rapidly, kind of a, a mark of that instability of that solution. Uh, but again, before you've got that crystal formation, you might have a brief unstable situation where you've got more than the normal amount being dissolved in that solution. Uh, and we call, again, call that a super saturated solution. Okay, last vocab word to hear I wanna talk about is what we call a colloid. So before we talk about colloid, I just wanna talk about the difference between something that's soluble and insoluble uh, when you've got a solid solute. Now, if it's soluble, that solid solute's just gonna dissolve into the solution and be homogeneous throughout. So however, if it's insoluble, it's probably just gonna settle out on the bottom and you could either filter it or centrifuge it to, to form a pellet on the bottom and stuff like that to get rid of it and separate it from that solvent. Well, it turns out in between something that's soluble forming a homogeneous solution and something that's insoluble, we also have what's called a colloid, sometimes called a colloidal suspension or a colloidal dispersion. 
And so it turns out this is also a form of homogeneous solution, but it's a little bit different. Instead of the molecules or atoms, you know, completely dissolving and separating out, and each individual particle is either an atom or a molecule, it turns out your colloidal suspensions, the particle sizes are larger. And it's usually like a glob of molecules and things of this sort. It turns out milk is, a, milk is an example of one of these colloidal suspensions. And it turns out you've got these big fat molecules uh, in clumps together. So it's not just one fat molecule, they're in clumps or globs of fat molecules together. And these larger particles still stay suspended, they don't settle out at the bottom or anything like that. And that's what makes it a colloidal suspension. So you can't, turns out you just can't separate them out by normal uh, either filtration or centrifugation. It turns out they also scatter light in a way that a normal homogeneous solution would not. And so you shine light through a colloidal suspension and the light's gonna get scattered in a way that again does not happen. And so that's another way you can tell, do you have a homo just a plain old homogeneous solution or do you have a colloidal suspension based on that scattering of light? So now I wanna take a look at some factors affecting solubility. And we'll start by looking at the solubility of gases. Take an extended look there and then we'll very briefly take a look at the solubility of most solids. All right, so solubility of gases. There's two big things that are gonna affect the solubility of a gas, and that's temperature and pressure. And it turns out that all gases are gonna be more soluble at lower temperatures, but higher pressures. And so we'll start with lower temperatures here. So here you've got the solubility plotted as a function of temperature for both O2, carbon monoxide, and N2. And you can see that for each one, the solubility is gonna decrease as we go towards higher and higher temperatures. So, and this is again true for all gases. So perhaps you've made spaghetti on occasion. And if you make spaghetti, first thing you do is boil some water. So, and if you boil a big stock pot full of water, it's probably gonna take several minutes for that water to come to a rolling boil. So, but if you pay attention, next time you're, you're making some spaghetti, you'll probably notice that you're gonna have some little bubbles bubbling up long before the solution ever comes to a boil. And those little bubbles bubbling up are not, you know, water boiling earlier, it's just hotter at the bottom or anything like that. It's nothing like that. So it's not water boiling at all, it's actually some of these gases coming out as the temperature goes up. Because as the temperature goes up, they become less soluble and they've gotta come out of the solution. So it turns out your water already has, you know, some carbon dioxide and O2 dissolved in it and things of this sort, and those gases come out as you heat it up. And the second thing here is that gases, again, are more soluble at higher pressure. We actually quantify this with what's known as Henry's Law. Henry's Law says that the solubility of a particular gas, and we're going to be using O2 as an example here in a second, so that's what I'm going to use here in my definition, but the solubility of a particular gas is going to equal that Henry's Law constant, so times the partial pressure of that gas in the air around it. And so the idea is that the more of that gas you have in the air around a solution, the more of that gas actually makes it into the solution. They're directly proportional. You double that partial pressure of oxygen above the solution, you're gonna double how much is actually dissolved in the solution as well. And the proportionality constant between them is called that Henry's Law constant. Now it turns out that Henry's Law constant for O2 in water at 25 degrees Celsius, so you'll notice that it's specific for a given solute in a given solvent at a particular temperature. So all of these matter. Uh, and in this case for O2 in water at 25 degrees Celsius, it's 1.3 times 10 to the negative three molar per atmosphere. You can kind of even see the units there. It's per atmosphere. If you have a one atmosphere of O2, then that's what the molar, you know, that's what the solubility here would be, 1.3 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. If you had two atmospheres, then it would be double that number and so on and so forth. It's the molarity per atmosphere that you have. And so that's what we're going to do in this case. We want to find the solubility of O2 in water at sea level. And the impl implication here is that at sea level, so you're going to have a partial pressure of oxygen of 0.21 atmospheres in the air. And so if we solve for this here, we're going to get the solubility of O2 equals that Henry's Law constant of 1.3 times 10 to the negative three molar per atmosphere times our 0 0.21 atmospheres. And I'm gonna need my calculator. And so here 1.3 times 10 to the negative three times 0.21, and we're gonna get 2.73 times 10 to the negative four. That's in units of molarity. So it makes sense that, you know, our solubility is lower than the Henry's Law constant, because again, the Henry's Law constant would be what the solubility would be for one atmosphere. And since we have considerably less than one atmosphere pressure, then our solubility should be less than that Henry's Law constant.
The last in this lesson, we're going to take a look at the solubility of ionic solids. And, and in general, solid solutes, the vast majority are going to be more soluble at higher temperatures. And we'll take a look at three ionic examples here. We're going to look at lead nitrate, potassium dichromate, and potassium bromide. So we see some varying solubility according to temperature, but one thing we see in common for all three is that you have an upward slope, a positive slope, and that means that you have an increasing solubility as the temperature goes up. Now, there are exceptions to this, but they are few and far between. And again, this is usually true for not just ionic solids, but almost all solid solutes. At higher temperatures, uh, basically have more kinetic energy amongst the molecules, and they're easier to separate out uh, within that solute as a result. So it's just true for sugar. Sugar is more soluble at higher temperatures, even though sugar is not an ionic compound either. So again, rule of thumb, just kind of assume that most solids are gonna be more soluble at higher temperatures. But just again, there are exceptions, but they are few and far between. Now, if you found this lesson helpful and you'd like to support the channel, a like goes a long way to making sure YouTube shares this lesson with other students. And perhaps you'd benefit from any of my other playlists on high school chemistry, organic chemistry, and general physics. And at chadsprep.com, I've also got free playlists on basic biochemistry and physical chemistry as well. And if you're looking for the study guides that go with these lessons, if you are looking for practice problems, I've got over 1,200 incorporated in my general chemistry master course. A free trial is available. I'll leave a link in the description. Happy studying.